Welcome to HMG Live. How are we more responsible with our employees by making sure that we have created the most, you know, equitable and inclusive workforce and um, are taking, you know, actions, um, not just words, but actions to ensure that we have um, a, a workplace where employees can do the work of their lives. It is time uh, to look at this thoughtfully and really seize on the opportunities that it provides us. This is an opportunity to change the way we work, to change the way we collaborate, to change the culture of the whole workforce in the United States. A lot of the decisions that you make may or may not be right at the end of the crisis, right? So you have to uh, be courageous enough to continue to make those decisions very quickly. The focus now is the fusion of human and technology and how do we, how do we have organizations that are technology organizations, but are, are, are human, they're distinctly human. This will be a time of innovation. HMG Live virtual summits are offered by HMG Strategy, your global partner, helping you reinvent an innovative future of work. A warm welcome to today's host, lead principal and CEO of HMG Strategy, Hunter Muller. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Dallas CIO Virtual Summit. I'm Hunter Muller, uh, Lead Principal of HMG Strategy. My team and I are delighted to be here with you today. And I think you'll find we have a world-class agenda. You know, we came to Dallas about 14 years ago looking to partner with the right players in the Dallas-Fort Worth market. And early on, the Dallas-Fort Worth chapter, SIM chapter, embraced us. Uh, we'll hear more from them here in just a minute. But it's been a fantastic relationship for some 14 years and in Kenley, it gave us the, the strength and the spirit to bridge from, from Dallas to Houston to open up the West Coast. Uh, so uh, in many ways, uh, Dallas and uh, Texas Strong helped HMG see the vision of the West Coast, where we then segued to Silicon Valley, San Francisco, LA, and San Diego, and became, I think, the number one platform or network. But we're here today reimagining the business and the future of work, what you need to know now, I can't think of a more exciting, challenging, and a critical time to really leaning in with passion, leaning in with courage, leaning in with authenticity to be successful in today's challenging environment. So glad you made it. We couldn't do what we do at HMG Strategy without amazing partners. Uh, today's summit is powered by Zoom, Nutanix, Commvault, and Darktrace, uh, arguably four of the most innovative, disruptive companies right now in our industry. And thank you for... Uh, uh, supporting us today and, and really uh, as a national partner, Zoom and Darktrace, truly appreciate Nutanix as well and Commvault. So, you know, we, again, back to the, our Dallas-Fort Worth chapter and our friends, uh, I think Nelson Burns, former president and chairman of the chapter was going to jump on and say hello. Nelson, you there? Hunter, thank you so much for uh, partnering with us for 14 years. Uh, when I think about Hunter and HMG, I think about innovation and I think about network. And uh, those two things are really coming through today. Um, you know, uh, HMG was the first virtual conference that I attended uh, once uh, COVID really started heating up in America. And uh, then fast forward till today. And wow, Hunter, your production value is just incredible uh, with this experience. So uh, keep it up. Um, this, is, this is an event I make time for every year. And I guess this year with smaller virtual events, I'm making time several times throughout the year for it but I wouldn't miss it for the world. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know what SimDFW is, uh, reach out to me. Uh, you, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'd love to tell you all about it. Nelson Thanks, Burns. Great. Thanks, Nelson. Good to see you. I know Mark Taylor, the Sim International president, has been a great friend and a fan, and we've been had a great relationship for over a year. Mark, welcome to the program. Hey, Hunter. It's a real pleasure to be with the team here today. Just want to shout out to you and the HMG team for what you guys are doing. It is a fascinating moment that we're in right now, uh, historically, really, isn't it? And uh, I believe from the standpoint, as you mentioned, it's exciting, uh, the tremendous amount of innovation and a tremendous amount of challenge, right? All being faced by, by everyone uh, that's in our community today. I also want to give a shout out to Nelson and to uh, uh, Jamie Frost, the team that's leading the DFW SIM chapter. Uh, they've established a tremendous community of, of, of technology leaders, business leaders in technology uh, in DFW. And a, a good friend, Hunter, I know of the, of the HMG team and you've been a great friend to us. We just wanted to thank uh, you and the DFW team for all the work they're doing to keep this community vibrant uh, in, in DFW. Thanks a bunch, man. We really appreciate it. 
Excellent. Hey, Mark, thanks for making the program. So first up, Boyden, you here? Boyden, great to see you. Hey, a little context of uh, your background, because I think you really have a, a really fascinating background, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll link it into uh, CISA. But first, a little context of your background. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Well, um, I, I started my career off as a naval officer, a surface warfare officer in particular. Uh, and uh, when I got out of the Navy, I joined the Department of Homeland Security and uh, made my way into the cybersecurity mission there, starting with the um, office of the chief information officer. And a couple of years ago, uh, I was looking for even uh, bigger problems to solve and made my way to uh, what is now called the Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency, the newest cyber-focused organization in the federal civilian executive branch. Excellent. So in that role, you're the associate director uh, for the cybersecurity division of CISA. And what, what's, the mission? what's the mission? Yeah, well, a cybersecurity mission, cybersecurity division's mission is quite broad. We do everything from uh, incident response and threat hunting to trying to manage vulnerabilities. That's specifically the portfolio that I'm focused on. And by managing vulnerabilities, I mean um, trying to prevent them from entering the ecosphere in the first place, managing them once they're there and helping our stakeholders make risk-based or risk-informed decisions. Um, we also offer a lot of services. We publish a lot of guidance and best practices based on our unique vantage point, which spans all of the uh, federal civilian executive branch, uh, our relationships with the intelligence community and law enforcement communities, as well as our international partnerships and our cross-critical uh, cross infrastructure sector reach. Excellent stuff. So what is CISA doing right now to help uh, in this pandemic uh, with this crisis? What are you doing to help uh, uh, the enterprise tech, ex tech leaders? Excellent. Well, everything CISA does is about being the nation's risk advisor. And that means we're looking at ways that we can secure today and defend tomorrow. That all begins with gaining visibility into, into the attack surface or the ecosphere or whatever whatever terminology you like, it starts with our gaining visibility so that we can help our, our stakeholders make the best risk informed decisions that, are, that, are, that work for them. So since the pandemic began, we've been really focused on offering services that help COVID response related organizations uh, secure, uh, manage their vulnerabilities and secure, and secure their attack surface. Uh, so specifically that's um, our, what we call our cyber hygiene scans, which are network vulnerability scans. We also offer you know, remote penetration tests and um, a variety of other services. We're looking at sharing information to help them make the best decisions possible and also really convening the community and using our platform to bring industry and the federal government together uh, to share best practices and to make sense of the issues we're facing as fast as possible. Yeah, Boyden, we've uh, never seen this kind of a situation where within 120 days, everyone's working from home. I got to believe the threat uh, attack surface dramatically increased overnight. That is true. Uh, you know, this idea of a distributed workforce is uh, not new, but definitely accelerated. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of vulnerabilities coming out each week that we are scoring as you know, high priorities and critical. And, you know, one of the things that's probably uh, you know, change my perspective the most is that home users, you know, users working from home are relying on their home office networking uh, equipment uh, more than ever before. And so if, you know, users aren't really savvy about how to make sure that their, um, you know, their home office networking equipment is, is secure, that they could be in trouble. What can uh, our audience do to get involved with us, Hisa, and how can they help? Beautiful. So the first, the first thing is really go to CISA.gov, that's C-I-S-A.gov, and sign up for our alerts. We are amplifying alerts from the community. We are um, giving best practices on breaches that we've responded to. We're really giving our best guidance. It's uh, you know, heavily subscribed to by hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who are, are making good sense of it. After uh, signing up for our, our information, you could enroll in our services. Our services are all free. Um, you know, if you already are paying for a similar service like our network vulnerability scanning, consider CISA sort of the check sum to the service you're paying for. You can get a free validation that your service is, uh, is, is working and you know, you'll be a great citizen by enabling us to have um, access to, uh, to some information about you. We never use uh, you know, individual 
identities when we do our trends reports, but it really helps us understand where we need to um, focus more attention, you know, lobby Congress for more funds uh, and, uh, you know, and do what we can to bring the federal government's attention to issues that plague the whole nation. Well, thanks, Boyd. And, you know, you can't turn on the news without hearing about the urgency and the whole discussions about, around diversity and inclusion. What are you folks doing uh, at CISA to uh, help that? Oh, thank you for asking. You know, I'm really proud of our agency. We have stepped up. Uh, our, our, uh, our director, Director Krebs, was quick out of the box with some important messages to let, the, let our employees know how much we care about having a diverse and inclusive workforce. And then uh, the next step is uh, taking a look at how we as leaders are helping or hindering either through unconscious bias or through or you know, through uh, hopefully, uh, or 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 through just systemic realities, you know, being a part of the problem or being part of the solution. So we've stood up a diversity and inclusion team that is made from a complement of uh, people from all levels of the workforce. They're helping us identify where we have uh, room for improvement in hiring a more diverse workforce and where we can be better at listening to the needs of our employees and making sure that they get what they need to feel really safe and able to contribute at work. Excellent stuff. Boyden, what would you consider would be your number one leadership challenge uh, right now uh, in leading this mission? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think right now uh, the number one challenge is, you know, the, just the volume of work is really high. You know, I joke that um, I joke that CIS's mission, or at least cybersecurity division's mission, is like securing the internet. I mean, it's almost an insurmountable and unboundable task. Uh, so really the goal is, you know, responding to what we need to today, but then also not losing sight of ensuring that we are doing what we can to prevent vulnerabilities from entering the ecosystem in the first place. You know, we're never going to get ahead of the problem if we keep incentivizing, uh, keep incentivizing the community to do, to do things the way they always have done. So trying to think of new ways to solve, to solve uh, problems that have plagued us. Boyden, well, hey, thanks for coming on the program today. And uh, please stay with us if you can. And uh, thank you for your service. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Appreciate Great it. Great to see you again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Boyden Rohner, Associate Director, Cyber Security Division of CISA. Thanks again, Boyden. Take care. See you soon. Okay, next up, the future of work. Gary Sorrentino, the Global Deputy CIO for Zoom. Everyone knows Zoom now, right? Everyone in the world, probably. Gary? Hey. Hey, Hunter. How are you doing? Thanks for inviting us. It's great to, great to see you, my friend. Um, hey, give us a little context of the ride at Zoom and what you're seeing out there today in the industry. So Zoom went from uh, a company that serviced enterprise clients to a company that also serviced uh, consumers. And so we saw uh, from about 10 million concurrent connections, clients a day to about 300 million. So there was a large rise in a very short period of time. And we also saw that tools like Zoom not only started to fill a gap in business, but also in personal. So we hear about people on too many Zoom calls a day, you know, they're all doing 10 Zoom calls a day, but then after the Zoom calls are finally done, much later than normal work stop, then it's the same tool we use to communicate with mom, to have a trivia with our friends, maybe uh, um, what do we call them, Zocktail hours now, and things like that rather than cocktail hours. And so the, the tool, the technology has really taken us through our corporate business day right into our personal life. Fascinating stuff, right? So the workforce is undergoing amazing transformation. What do you think the important steps are right now that leaders need to do to succeed in this whole journey? So I think leaders need to listen a lot more than they're doing now. I think along the way, we've had polls, we've talked to our employees, we try to understand their work-life balance issues, their work challenges. Not everybody has an office at home. Not everybody has a dedicated space. Uh, we have employees who are, their productivity is up, mostly because they're working through the commutes. Uh, we have employees where their productivity might not be up, and that's because they don't have the right setup at home. So we have a lot of work-life challenges. Uh, the children are homeschooling. They're not at camp. They're there. They, have to, they can't really go out. They have to be entertained, trained, taught. Um, so I think that, that leaders today really do need to listen more. Uh, I think we see some of the better leaders are doing more. It's not about polls. It's about talking to people, figuring out what people are thinking. Um, are they scared? Are they worried? Are they worried about their jobs? 
I also think that leaders really need to start thinking about those flexible work schedules, but they need to lead by example. Um, what happens when you get a text two o'clock in the morning and the computer's right there in your living room and you hear that bing? And so it's one thing to say, hey, look, I don't expect an answer, but to an employee, it's like, why didn't you set, why did you send the question? And so there's that obligation. And so I think that leaders are going to have to lead by example and figure out, hey, if I'm asking them not to answer at two o'clock in the morning, maybe I shouldn't send it at two o'clock in the morning. I think the last thing leaders have to figure out is how are we going to collaborate going forward? The, we kind of, we know what to do when 97% of the people are at work and we know what to do when hundred percent of the people are home. But what about that hybrid world? How are we going to manage productivity? How are we going to manage people figuring out, how do I go to work? How do I not go to work? Is it going to look at me negative if I don't go to work? My kids are home. I can't really leave home. And so there's going to be a lot of challenges. And I think it all comes down to your employees will tell you what they need and what they want if you just listen to them. And Gary, I had a chance to catch up with Eric last night, uh, your CEO, and he has really established an amazing culture at Zoom. And uh, it's just amazing uh, kind of a heartfelt culture. You want to talk about that a little bit? Look, Zoom is about employees and clients. We care about our employees and we care about our clients and our goal is to make them happy. They listen, they hear us, they talk to us, they, they instill in us to meet with our clients, discuss what they need to be happy. How do we make things better for them? Um, yeah, it's a sales company, right? So it's about selling the product. But at the end of the day, I probably had three or four calls today with people who are doing well, just to say, what do you need from us? How, how can we help you in your business? How can we help you as you try to re-entry? What, what do we need to do to be that partner to help you go forward? Um, the company's designed on delivering happiness and it's a, it's a great place to work. Exciting times, right? So how do you think services institutions will use Zoom's products in the future? I, I think we're, we're seeing it already. I think what we're seeing is the one-to-one -one conversations are for just about going away. It really is one to many. And I think people have to figure out culture really comes from what do we used to call them? Hallway collisions. They meet you on the way to the coffee room. I'm coming in the building. You're leaving the building. A lot of the culture is built that way about working together, supporting each other. Today's support is about it's planned. It's I set up a Zoom call with you. I set up a meeting to talk to Hunter. It's that culture doesn't build that way. Culture really is people wanting to work the way they want to work and then supporting it. And so I think that Zoom is going to be a really good product going forward as we keep companies connected in this hybrid world. Um, we've seen a lot of false starts. A lot of people have brought part of the people back to work and suddenly they were less productive. The whole team became less productive. The at-home workers were missing the conversation with the at-work workers and the at-work workers were missing the conversations and if you're just going to go to work physically and you're going to be on seven or eight Zoom calls a day, just like home, why would you go to work? And right. so I see a lot of false starts. And so products like Zoom in the future, that we have to figure out how to use them effectively to support a culture going forward. Fascinating stuff. So when you think of culture and the current work from home situation, how do you build culture? Yeah, I, we're all learning different. I'm different. I'm, I'm a different person uh, than I was pre-COVID. And one of the things about culture is don't think you understand it. When we, when we talk about this, it's we thought millennials were one way and Gen Z's were another. And I'm a baby boomer. You know, baby boomers are supposed to like to go to work and be in that work atmosphere and things like that. I've changed. And so we need to really figure out how to enable people to work they want, the way they want to work. I think that's highly important. We need to embrace the employee values. And a survey you did three weeks ago changed that you really need to figure out and you really need to get to the core of what are your employee values. Look, we're entering summer. Most people cancel their vacation because, well, I'm home today. I'm home tomorrow. Why take next week off when I'm just going to be home again? And so we need to make sure that we embrace their values to say, you need time off with your family. You need to disconnect and we need to support people for that. I think the other thing is people need to set boundaries. Um, we need to say, look, maybe you need to be off every Friday afternoon. Maybe you need to be off every Thursday morning. More about team predictability. 
Um, if Hunter, if me and you are a team, maybe you take Friday mornings off, I take Friday afternoons off, or you take Fridays off and I take Mondays off so we have coverage. But I think we need to set up those boundaries as leaders and also for our employees. They'll follow example. Interesting times, right? When you think of the new normal and uh, everyone living on Zoom time or on the Zoom platform, what are some of the successful skills and uh, performance attributes that really matter? We're all living in a new kind of technology. We, we had chat, we had collaboration tools, we had productivity tools, we had video conferencing, we had phones. We have to learn going forward how to, in, using this enabling technology, the technology that works the way we want it to work, the technology that will provide us a basis for being productive and collaborative with our coworkers. We have to um, a much adapt to the new technology. And, and I think that that's gonna be the skill going forward. The groups that can figure out how to get technology and humans to work together, that's gonna be the new killer app. Those things where technology are gonna put people out of work, I think groups that are embracing technology, figuring out what needs to be done by technology through AI and machine learning and what needs to be done by humans and then marrying that together with people who are skilled in using technology, I think that's gonna really help in the new normal. And the new normal is gonna be so far ahead, it will change a couple of times between now and then. You know, when you think about the, the workforce and as it's, as it's evolving, short-term, mid-term and long-term, what are some uh, interesting ideas that you have there? I think short-term we're gonna stay status quo. I think uh, most of the companies we're talking to have had some false starts. I think companies have done a couple of things. Let's get everybody back to work the way it was. Yeah, I don't think that's a good plan. Let's bring, let's bring half the people back to work and leave half the people home or in some ratio and we'll figure it out as we go. I don't think that's really gonna work. I think the companies that are really sitting back and saying, okay, let's reassess. Let's take this pause that was given to us and let's figure out what jobs need to come to the office, not people, what jobs need to come to the office, manufacturing, can't build cars at home, right? And what jobs can be done distant? Now, then let's look at our employees. Do we have employees that are 80-20? 80% can be done at home and 20% can be done at work. Well, why don't we maybe think about taking that 20% away and giving it to a person who's 80% at work and reversing some of the roles? So I think short term, they really have to start taking this time and figure out where, where should jobs be performed? The second thing is then is figure out, okay, how do we perform those jobs? This is a great time to think about change. This is a great time to say, we never had this. You know, we always talked about, what is it? Changing the oil when the plane is in the air, the plane landed. Right? Let's do what we can. Let's just not get it back in the air. Let's make it a better plane when it gets in the air. And so I think that short term companies really need to start thinking about this. Longer term, there'll be many adjustment cycles. I think that people have to start realizing uh, the necessity of travel and do we need that? The productivity of travel, the cost of travel. And how do we get that phased approach of do we send certain people back? Uh, I worked for Zoom and we talked about Eric and the way he looks at his company. He basically said, no one goes back until January because he didn't want the parents to worry about kids possibly going to school or not going to school in September. He didn't want to worry about childcare over the summer and in September and October. What he wanted us to do was focus on work and take that one angst that parents are getting off the table. And so I think all of these short and long-term decisions have to be made, tested, and readjust it to get to that long-term strategy. Interesting times, right? You're, uh, and Zoom and Eric specifically was recognized by Barron's in the past week as being one of the top 25 C CEOs of the year. Yes, he recently was and well-deserving. Um, it's, it's, like I said, it is a company that thinks about employees and clients. And it also thinks about how are we going to be uh, a major role in this transition? Well, Gary, thanks for coming on the program today. And thank you for being such a great partner and friend, I would say. Great. Love coming on, uh, on, on, your, on your events. So glad you went virtual with these and keeping the community together. So thank you as always. Great to see you, Gary. Take Talk care. Soon. Bye. Bye.
Next up, Shamin Mohammed, he's a senior vice president, and CIO, and CTO of CarMax. He's also a longtime friend of, of HMG and, my, and mine. Uh, Shamin, great to see you. Good to see you, Hunter. You know, I, you, we also have an interesting context, right, with uh, Sim over the years as well, right? I think we met when you were in Boston. Right. I was the program chair for Boston when I reached out to you, and you and I partnered together to put one of the first events in Boston. That was uh, 2009, eight, nine. That, that's a long time ago. Wow. Now I remember it really quite well. Yes. Yes. Good hey, to see you. you. You had some really interesting news. Congratulations on the new recognition uh, awards, perhaps one of the coveted, most coveted CIO of the Year award uh, programs in the country. Uh, a little context of uh, the award, uh, MIT, uh, and uh, a little background, if you would. Well, uh, thank you for that, um, Hunter. First of all, is uh, thanks for inviting me to this event, uh, especially the Dallas-based event. As you know, I have deep connection in, in Dallas. A lot of my family and friends, they all live in Dallas. So greetings to everyone. Hope uh, everybody is safe and sound. So this MIT award um, was uh, it's an interesting one because I did not actually uh, go in applying for it. A um, number of folks um, nominated me for this. And then to almost, almost the last day of the deadline, I did fill out the information and send it to MIT. And uh, I, I didn't realize that I would actually win this because I know how competitive it is. Uh, because what MIT does, they go around the world and get applications for uh, this award. And then very extensive process they have, very solid due diligence, and then they narrow it down to a few finalists and they select a winner. Uh, what I saw, they, even when after I saw this uh, caliber of the finalists, I said, okay, I have zero chance of winning because it's such an amazing uh, group of finalists that I was quite surprised when I received the award. Um, and uh, I was very grateful to receive it. It's definitely a career highlight for me. Uh, at the end of the day, though, it is a recognition for my team and what our organization has been able to do over the past few years at CarMax. Taking a traditional uh, market leader, brick and mortar market leader, and making that a true omni-channel digital company, um, that was quite a feat. And I have to give the credit to all of my, you know, 20,000 plus associates all over the country who made this award possible. So the recognition actually for them, but I was glad to receive it on behalf of them. That sounds, what, what a great story. Uh, you know, and it's an industry that's going through now its own innovative transformation. And you sound like you folks at CarMax are one of the leaders. Absolutely. It was, what's interesting about CarMax is that uh, we founded the company to disrupt the used car business. And you know, because nobody got up in the morning and said, hey, I want to be a used car salesman, right? Because the used car business had so many problems. So about 25 years ago, we recognized the need for transforming this business. So we brought you know, transparency, the integrity, and honesty in the process. By using a lot of great technology over the years, we've been able to continue to drive a great experience for customers. What happened uh, in the last few years is there's a lot of digital disruptors in the space. And so we basically said, you know, we disrupted the industry once. We can actually disrupt the industry for the second time by being that digital disruptor ourselves. So that's really what we've been doing. And it's been really amazing journey for us because we believe what we're able to do, bringing the physical experience and the digital experience and providing a seamless integration of the two, Nobody else can do that, right? And nobody else has that kind of capability. And, and that's really what we're offering to our customers right now. So, Shamin, it sounds to me like you were at the right time, the right place, and you were prepared to drive this omni-channel strategy. You probably have an amazing CEO that really backed you and, uh, and helped you uh, see that vision complete. Absolutely. I think uh, none of this would be possible without the support of, of the CEO and I would say two other key leaders of the company, you know, the CMO and the COO. As I look at the CIO profession or CTO profession or technology executive position, profession, I think the, the number one criteria for anyone to be successful is to be able to build a great, great partnership with some of the C-suite part, uh, you know, uh, leaders. Without that, a technology leader will not be successful. Because especially now, if you think about it, 
technology is all about transforming your business. And it's not just transforming your technology, right? Technology transformation is easy. Uh, digital is easy. It's really the transformation piece that is the most critical piece. And for to be successful, you got to have the support from either either your CMO, CEO, and definitely your CEO. And, and pretty much everybody in the in your C-suite, you they must support you because the transformation is very risky, challenging, and it is uh, it is hard, very very hard. Hey, Shamin, how about some tips about how to build rapport with a senior executive that you report to or or a dotted line? How do you build the the richness of the and the rapport? What, what really matters? I think there are a couple of things that I believe is really important. One is um, having a regular discussion with them, right? Very open and frank conversation with them in terms of the challenges you are facing, the possibilities that you see, um, and what can be accomplished as a company, right? If you have those regular dialogues, then it makes it much easier. So for example, at CarMax, I meet with the CMO and COO every single day. Even in this virtual world, we meet every, every morning, we meet for a few minutes. So that informal collection is really, really important. The other thing is you really have to understand what problem they're trying to solve. If you can come across as a, you know, someone who's really, really genuinely interested in making their lives easier and solving their problem, uh, then you get their support. So it's pretty, actually at the end of the day, Hunter is pretty basic but a lot of leaders don't do the basic, unfortunately. So, so having the informal right. conversation and what, having their back and helping them be successful, I mean, they, they work. <laughs> you do the work, you come in prepared, you do your homework, you probably also benchmark the competition in the industry so you can come to the table with a strategic point of view, right? Absolutely, and, and to that point, you know, not easy to just go with them to recommendation and different things, but take them with you for the journey. And you and I talked about this in the past. So the, the C-suite uh, executive I have, the colleagues, we make quite, quite free, frequent trips out to the Silicon Valley. And we talk to a lot of the startups and you know, technology companies just to understand how they're approaching their business, how they're innovating, how, what they're focusing on. All of those things really help you know, solidify the partnership we have uh, with my colleagues. Excellent stuff. When you think of your leadership style, how would you characterize it? The biggest thing I would say as a leader that I believe uh, that I, I, I have and which helped serve me really well over the years is lead with humility, right? Knowing that I don't know everything is really important, especially today. If we think about today's world, and I was listening to Gary earlier, you know, a lot of the innovation really don't come from me. I, I don't have all the great ideas. And I don't have to be the smartest person in the world. It's really having the humility and leadership uh, confidence that, hey, you can be surrounded by really smart people and you can learn from anybody. And that anybody can be somebody from, that is just hired from college, you know, maybe a 22 year old kid you know, out of college who can teach you something. So having that humility to learn from others and not coming to, a situation where it's like you, you, you feel like you have to have all answers. It's really, really important. And that's what I believe in strongly. Um, and the other thing I'll say related to that is having a beginner's mindset. Always look for ways to learn. And again, I, I was listening to Gary and your first speaker. We got to learn. And what do we, in the last three months, have really taught us that we must be open to learning because what we knew back in February, a lot of cases are no longer relevant. The leadership principle and practice we had three months ago doesn't work anymore. So if we're not learning the new ways, we won't be successful. We saw this, we saw this tsunami coming on in early March, and it, I came to this insight. It said, what got you to this point will not get you through the next three, 12 months. And I, we thought it was going to be tough. We thought it was going to be bad. No idea how tough and hard work had, it was, had been required to get to this next point, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, hey, you know, Shameen, you guys. Great, great job. You're going to be on the panel here right behind this. So um, I, I think this completes this little piece, but uh, really appreciate your coming on the program and very, very, very cool. Thank you so much. Well, great to be here, Hunter. Talk to you soon. Yes, stay with us. Uh, so next up is our reimagining uh, the business and the future of work panel. And Lev, Lev Gonick is here. 
Lev, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, Lev's the CIO of Arizona State University. Arizona State, what's going on down there? You guys are getting all sorts of recognition for being a leader and an, inv an innovator, right? Yeah, I think it's, uh, first of all, thank you for having us, Hunter. Uh, sorry not to be with you in North Scottsdale on this particular uh, HMG event, but glad to join you in Dallas. Uh, you know, ASU, as you know, uh, has a, a well-earned reputation for being, uh, uh, at least by US and News and World Report, the, the most innovative uh, university in the land, five years in a row, actually since the inception of the designation. And certainly uh, this last uh, uh, two quarters um, has put us to the test and I'll be looking forward to sharing some of the ways in which ASU has continued to differentiate and distinguish itself, uh, certainly from not only our university peers, but also partners uh, throughout the metropolitan Phoenix area. Hey, Lev, what did the uh, pandemic do to your role at ASU and did it reframe it? Absolutely. Uh, it uh, very much uh, allowed us to reset uh, the mindset of the role of technology. We have, uh, as uh, both uh, Gary uh, and uh, Shamim have indicated, we have an outstanding CEO who understands and actually is a, a principal um, advocate for the use of technology. But for most of the rest of the university, it's always been seen as a cost center. Uh, and certainly uh, COVID-19 uh, allowed us to reframe because overnight, uh, literally uh, on March 16th, after 72 hours of preparation, we flipped the largest university in the country. Uh, that means 5,000 faculty, 140,000 students, over 4,000 courses all overnight. And all of a sudden, we were more than a cost center. We were actually the lifesaver. And again, I know most of our viewers today probably don't work in uh, education and maybe don't have much of a recollection of it. But, you know, in the 30 years I've been in this industry, it's the first time that the Academic Senate, which is all the professors, not only didn't have anything bad to say about technology, we actually got a commendation from the faculty senate saying, really, uh, without the enterprise IT organization, uh, it would have been a very different uh, outcome. The highest ever student reviews in terms of their satisfaction um, at the university was this spring, which is a remarkable, remarkable thing. Nice update. Uh, Lev, how would you characterize your leadership style through this whole trying time? A part of it is to be uh, engaging and to trying to be helpful to, uh, again, not only frame why we did so well to my own peers, the other executive members of the university, in terms of telling them why the investments that we made are paying off dividends, but also trying to help them pivot uh, and take advantage of the, of the technology infrastructure, the mindset, uh, the engagement strategy that we have to help them with their lines of business where typically and traditionally they've been, uh, some of them were more reluctant and were kind of wait and see. Uh, obviously we had huge support in the academic arena, uh, which made all the difference. And now we're seeing literally, um, although we're sitting in 114 degree weather, we're seeing a snowball effect uh, unfolding here where everyone is in the queue saying, how do we get some of that IT secret sauce that is proving hugely valuable to what, again, everyone on, on this event would know, a customer satisfaction kind of score. Sure, great, good, good stuff. Lev, thanks for making this the program. Stay with us. Uh, next up is Mike McCranny. Mike's the EDP and CIO at Interstate Batteries. Mike, uh, great to see you. Good to see you, Hunter. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's been a while. Now, where are you based? I'm based in Dallas now. Uh, all my career was uh, literally based in Atlanta until about two years ago. As you know, I, I grew up in the Kimberly Clark world uh, and was able to work all over the world. And then I've had a couple of CI role, CIO roles since then. And now I'm here based in Atlanta or in Dallas with Interstate Batteries. Excellent. So give us an update. What's changed for you uh, post uh, pandemic? Wow. Um, I'll tell you this. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on the company, and this will help set the stage and give you context. Uh, Interstate Batteries is about a $2 billion distribution company. We distribute automotive batteries in large part. Um, it's a family owned company. Uh, it's been around for 70 years. So you can imagine there's, there's a lot of risk averse behavior. Uh, things, are, things are going well, let's not change anything. Um, fortunately, a few years ago, uh, the CEO brought in Bain and Company to 
just revamp the entire company's long-term roadmap, their strategy. And that strategy turned out to be very technology dependent. Now, I would love to tell you guys it's dependent upon, you know, machine learning and AI and all the, all the edge, uh, the cutting edge capabilities that are out there today, but it's really getting good distribution and supply chain capability in place that wasn't there before. Um, he has since then changed a lot of the leadership team, changing the culture to a culture that is more uh, learner versus knower. Uh, Shamim mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, have a beginner's mindset. So we're trying to change our culture in that regard. So we're always trying to continuously improve. So out of that, even before COVID, we had shaped probably the largest project in the company's history, which is a, a technology transformation, uh, changing all the technology, business-driven project, by the way, uh, from its core outward. So probably changing 95% plus of the technology base in the way the company runs, giving us good basic supply chain capability, but allowing us to reach the consumers uh, like we couldn't before. Now, go to COVID. With COVID, um, everyone wants to stop everything, right? And I think the tendency is to attempt to continue uh, business as usual, just remotely um, for as long as possible uh, and until something stresses the system and it breaks. Um, I felt like to not use this as a springboard was a mistake. So I, I pressed even further uh, with my peers, my board, uh, to allow us to uh, continue forward with our project, even accelerate it quite a bit. Uh, and we've, we've kind of had the handcuffs removed from us. We're moving forward really fast, um, which is really difficult if you think about it in a time of remote working, when you're looking at these large, large projects where people are typically sitting in rooms and workshops and these types of things but we're doing it all remotely. Um, and I think it's, it's a huge shift for this company, again, who is very risk averse to decide to take on a project of this magnitude during this time. Can you give us a little more detail on that project? Because it sounds like you are putting this crisis to good use. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, this project is, we have about, gosh, 280 plus different applications that span across the company. Um, it's a dog's breakfast of solutions. Any CIO or IT leader on the phone has been in these situations, right? It's not well integrated. There's no focus on master data. Um, it would have taken years to unravel this, especially all the bad business process that was baked into that. So we're, we're going a bit old school, right? Uh, we're, we're starting with a, a wholesale ERP implementation. I like to say we're dropping a stick of dynamite on the old way of doing it. And starting over so we're implementing you know core SAP S4 technology uh, with a lot of capability on the edge around transformation or uh, transportation management warehouse management uh, new analytics tools uh, new customer facing tools with with marketing and the digital space it is literally a wholesale change across the company sounds like the uh, timing lined up perfectly for you and the company yes sir great great stuff Mike I'll circle back to you here in a minute Shamin, welcome back to the program. And uh, when you think about inspiring and building a, a team, a workforce around you, what's the best way to get people on the same page? Hunter, glad to be back again. Uh, Mike, nice to meet you and Lev. Uh, so in terms of inspiring the team, I think some of the fundamentals are still the same. Like what was important before, having a great culture, creating and empowered teams, Giving them, giving them a shared vision, all those things are still very, very important. So at CarMax, for example, you know, a few years ago, I took the journey, or Mike is, looks like just started the journey. Uh, I took that a few years ago. Uh, one of the big things we did is we changed how our teams actually work. So rather than having big, large, monolithic project with hundreds of people for two years, we actually broke down into smaller product teams. And these teams are seven to nine people. They're given specific goals. And then they have the flexibility and latitude to figure out how to achieve those goals. So by doing that, we actually been able to inspire those teams because now they are in some way in, in charge of their own destiny. And they are extremely creative, right? And, and they're encouraged to experiment, test and learn. They feel empowered. They have, uh, and they have transparency into the work they do. Uh, and because we, are, we, we listen to them and we watch everything they do every two weeks. So by creating an environment where they're in charge of their own future is significant, very empowering and very inspirational. And that's how we work. And it's, I'm glad that we started that before the you know, pandemic because in post you know, pandemic right now, that model is working really well because whether they're physically sitting next to each other 
or working in a virtual setting through Zoom or other technologies, they still are working that way. And that's, this has been really good. So we haven't really missed a beat um, since the pandemic happened uh, because of the way we work. Has, uh, did you label this as a, was it a, a cult, uh, culture change or was there, a, with the initiative, did you have a, a, a code team name for it? No, it was not a, like any big thing. So it was basically, we, we, you know, when we started our sort of digital transformation journey, one of the big thing was um, changing how we work, how we work, what do we value, how do we organize our teams? Um, what do we focus on? So we focus on those things. And over the last three, four years, we've been kind of refining those. And now we get a model that works really well. Are you seeing uh, some green shoots, Shamin, in the economy as uh, things start to pick up? Well, I can share what we opened, share with the, with the market just the three weeks ago. We had an earnings call for the first quarter. Um, so we finished our fiscal year end of February. And that was our a record year for us from revenue and profit and a number of dimensions. We had a tremendous momentum coming into the new fiscal year in March. Then on March 17, we had to basically shut down our business completely. We just said, okay, we're gonna shut down everything. And because of the way we work, because of the resiliency of our business and our, and our associates, within a matter of a few weeks, we actually been able to open most of our locations. And what we shared with the market is that as of three weeks ago, we're already within 10% of our last year's sell. So we, we recovered most of the sales that were uh, lost uh, during the pandemic and we're almost back to normal, which is incredible given you know, the physical nature of our product, right? Our product is cars and people have to buy them, we have to recondition them, we have to sell them. So I feel like, you know, at least the initial phase of this pandemic, we've been able to wither fairly well but as many of you already said, we haven't seen the worst yet probably because you know, things are still popping up in Texas and Arizona and Florida. So we're, we're keeping a close eye. By the end of the day, because of how we work and how our teams are so organized around common mission and goals and they work kind of independently, it's really allowing us to respond very quickly to whatever comes our way. And Shamin, it's really that front end, the digital front end for the whole company as you engage the consumer, right? Absolutely, absolutely. It's, you know, the way we look at it is two ways, right? Anything that our customers are using directly, the customer facing technologies and capabilities, and everything that our associates are using, we call them you know, customer enabling technology. So that's it. I mean, there's really both end with customers. First, customers use it themselves. Other one is our, our, our users, our associates are using to take care of the customer. So this is how we look at the world. Great, love it. Uh, stay with us, Shmi. I'll be back to you in a minute. Hey, Lev, you've uh, been on the, the front edge of uh, the, the learning, uh, engaging students, a uh, large university. Talk to us about the kind of the, the learning aspect of digital learning. What's, what's different today than just three to six months ago? And what are you doing to help the, the student body stay engaged? Yes, uh, remarkably, uh, students, uh, again, I say remarkably because it, it, only ironically, students are ready. Uh, they've been voting with their pocketbooks and their clicks uh, for years. Uh, ASU 10 years ago began ASU online, 60,000 students pursuing 240 degrees. I mean, there aren't too many universities in the country with that size of a population. And that's just one of our service uh, providers. So the students are very much in the, uh, there certainly are students in the marketplace who value the time shifting capabilities of online learning. But when March 16th happened, we went to a remote modality, which was live, not time shifted, live during the regular scheduled uh, time frames. And again, interestingly enough, uh, students uh, were very much uh, not only prepared to learn, but to also help their faculty colleagues help to actually create a better learning experience because students being more digitally native had better sense of the other collaboration tools on top of the 400 million minutes of Zoom calls that we made in the spring semester, that's a big number, there were literally over 50 different technologies that, that we, the technology community, didn't introduce alone. Our students were bringing to us tools that they were using in their social media world, uh, in their uh, online uh, gaming world, 
bringing all those uh, technologies into play. So learning became actually at what it should be, which is more of a contact sport and not a spectator sport. Students were engaged, faculty were engaged, and it was a really kind of collective digital barn raising uh, that I think um, is part of the spirit of what ASU is doing and at this very moment when the rest of the country, certainly in education, is very concerned about you know, how we're gonna bring students back. Um, ASU right now seeing this very much as just one more challenge. Interesting. It sounds like you're having fun too. Actually, uh, we are actually having a lot of fun because I'm learning. I'm going to go back to something Shamim said earlier on. Uh, this sort of day one uh, mindset, this learning mindset, um, I, I have found myself more interested uh, in the metaverse and in the e-gaming world than I've ever been because it turns out students have been spending a lot of hours there. They just weren't doing it, quote unquote, while they were learning. Now we're actually finding ways to work together with gaming platform technologies to actually make it a fun space, but it's also an engaging space because that's where students have already found themselves and they're inviting the education community to come join them there. Hey, Lev, uh, Mark Polanski uh, made the connection with us and Mark uh, from Corn Ferry always talks about the importance of being a lifelong learner, right? Absolutely, and, and, and uh, Mark and I have known each other a long time. Um, and again, I think that there is both for he and for I uh, a commitment, a sort of a deep uh, a commitment to the, to the wisdom of that insight, to always see yourself engaged in learning, surrounding yourself. I mean, again, to Shamim's earlier point, I surround myself with literally thousands of young, smart students who are my, uh, part of my own team, my own enterprise IT team. And I have a personal technology coach who's not a senior mentor. She's a 19-year-old second-year student at ASU, and that's the way it should be. I love it, love it, love it. Uh, you know, over to you, Mike, in a second. I was at a recent summit we had in uh, New Jersey about three months ago. Jim Swanson, the global CIO at Johnson & Johnson, talked about uh, leading with humility, leading as a servant leader, uh, leading with an open heart, and that through humility, by getting the right people in the room, you can usually get a better answer, right? Um, and I think kind of in different ways, we're discussing a different mindset on leading in very challenging times. Mike, how did you lead your, uh, how did you get direction and lead your board and your C-suite through these trying times? Uh, it, you know, in, in a, look, you said it before, a family owned company, right? So there's gonna be a specific mindset or dogma on how they think about things, right, Mike? Yeah, absolutely, Hunter. Um, if we think about what our board is asking today more broadly, First of all, they want to know about the health and safety of our employees, right? Uh, every board is asking that. Um, they're asking about any risks to our supply chain. How are those risks being mitigated? Uh, they want to understand if we have any societal risk or brand risk, uh, ensuring that you know we're not going in places where we're potentially exposing people uh, to the virus, if you will, uh, that could impact our brand. They're asking how we're conserving cash. We've, we've all heard that uh, obviously a lot over the past several months. Uh, when it comes specifically to me, they have asked, hey, we're conserving cash now. Um, what capabilities are you gonna go after, right? So they're wise enough uh, to ask that question. It has taken a lot of prodding from me over the past year and a half to get them to ask those questions and realize that, that we are uh, several iterations behind the times uh, when it comes to automotive aftermarket uh, parts uh, segments. Um, so, so they have begun asking that question, which was investment that's paid off for me again over the past year and a half. So that I can now say, here's what we're planning to do, right? Uh, we talked about those larger scale projects earlier. There's some more things that we're doing to connect our consumers directly to uh, what we call dealers, which might be Hunter's Garage, if you will, as an automotive repair shop type of thing. Uh, but the fact that they're asking the question uh, is, is really good. Excellent stuff, Mike. Hey, uh, not necessarily for you, Mike, might be Shamin or Lev. Are you working with your partners any differently now uh, in this environment? Are you asking for different concessions or different uh, ways to negotiate with them? So it's really a long-term partnership, not a supplier relationship. Yeah, I, I can speak to that first. And I'm sure these guys have a lot to add there too. And I'm going to move specifically to technology partners that we're working with. Um, we, uh, again, have just brokered these deals for these, these, these mega projects, as you, as you talked about. Shamim mentioned monolithic projects. You know, two years ago, they would have been 
you know, five-year projects. Uh, we're having to scope these projects differently, run them differently as product teams, as he mentioned. Uh, some of these larger partners are changing the way they work to accommodate the way that we want to work. Also, uh, they're having to be flexible when it comes to working in virtual environments, which is very uncommon for these large scale initiatives. So, so we're doing a lot to, to partner with them differently, asking them to make concessions as far as rates, because you're not gonna have certain travel uh, expenses, things like that. There's lots of give and take that's happening now that may not have happened in the past for us. Excellent, thanks Mike. And I'll go with, um, I'll, I'll agree with uh, Mike, you know, a lot of the similar conversation we've been having. Um, what I feel fortunate is that uh, we built some really strong partnership with some of the key technology uh, suppliers over the years. And as some projects we had to slow down because it didn't make sense anymore. Some projects we had to accelerate because we wanted to get fast to market faster for, with some things. Our partners have been really supportive, whether it's uh, deferring some payments or uh, you know, reducing some rates and being flexible with some of the arrangement we had before and not really holding us to the, what we had originally signed up for. So it's been a good partnership there. Um, and, and, I, and, 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 you know, everybody really came to the table with options and flexibility. And some of the partners I know are on the call here. So thank you for your partnership. Excellent. Great, Shamin. Thank you for just, the time. I could just add one quick story. Um, obviously, uh, as Gary shared early on, uh, one of the first markets being served by Zoom was the enterprise. ASU was one of the very first uh, enterprise customers. And, you know, basically I wrote a check and they delivered great technology. However, uh, when we uh, hit uh, the early March and realized that uh, this was not only a tsunami, this was climate change, we were going to change forever uh, the way we were going to do business. Uh, uh, we managed to broker a terrific relationship uh, introduction between the CEOs. Uh, so Eric and Michael Crow, our CEO, um, actually got to know each other. They started talking about how they were going to change the future together. Eric made a commitment to actually putting in a uh, engineering research and development facility, hiring up to 500 uh, people in the uh, metropolitan area. Uh, that in turn has led to engineering uh, collaborations that are going on. So there's a good example where, you know, a traditional uh, uh, vendor uh, 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 buyer relationship uh, got transformed because of the opportunity of the leaders to see that there was a whole lot more than just good technology or check. This is a great panel, guys. I love it. Uh, might be going down as the number one panel uh, in the pandemic so far. Good job. Uh, kind of a last kind of big topic or question, uh, being boardroom ready, preparing, uh, to, preparing to present to boards or getting on a board. Um, anyone want to kind of tackle that one? Either, either side of it? I think uh, I can go. Uh, so, so one of my one of the big advantage of uh, being uh, the technology executive for a company like Carmax is I get to interact with our board of directors on a regular basis. Um, and initially, it was more around update on cybersecurity and those kind of stuff, which uh, is pretty typical for every uh, senior executive, technology executive. But what it has transformed into is more of a partnership and discussion and guidance from them and more regular touch base, you know, so we don't go just present once a quarter, right? You know, we touch base with the board of directors, keeping me in the loop, especially I know that during the pandemic, you know, my boss is having weekly conversation with our board of directors every week. I mean, they have a regular meeting and uh, we touch base and we keep it informed, which has been very good. So the board partnership and relationship and communication has been a lot more frequent and a lot more, I would say impromptu um, in a lot of cases. Uh, but as a, as a technology leader, I mean, I, I feel very fortunate to have a, a set of board of directors who have a lot of incredible experience that I can tap into and learn from them. So which has been very, very powerful. Uh, getting on the board, um, one thing I'll tell you is, um, you know, nonprofit. I know some people say don't go to nonprofit is different, but get on a meaningful nonprofit board that, for a mission that you feel really passionate about. Uh, one of the board that I serve on is Greater Richmond YMCA. So it's... Um, we, we served, last year we served 225,000 people in the central Virginia area. So it is like a profit organization almost because we have probably 4,000 you know, uh, employees, uh, a big, big uh, financial budget and all those stuff. So it's like a typical profit board, but in a nonprofit setting. And I'm getting great experience. I'm, I'm pretty sure 
that will be very helpful if I join a for-profit board someday. Excellent, excellent stuff, Shamin. And I Tell just sort of know. add, having run, having run a nonprofit uh, organization, um, I very much want to second uh, the suggestion that it uh, can be very gratifying. And uh, we, uh, those who ran nonprofit boards, very much need technology leaders uh, to help advance an understanding of how to transform the same digital transformation that we've leading our companies need to help uh, transform uh, the, uh, the nonprofit sector as well. And uh, again, I would say um, I've certainly enjoyed uh, during uh, this period of time an opportunity to both listen and learn from the executive of the university, our executive committee, which is effectively our board, um, and uh, certainly an opportunity to also contribute uh, to it. And I think, again, uh, help to change the attitude, uh, which is deep and learned over, over literally decades of what IT uh, can and should represent uh, to a multifaceted organization. In our case, very much committed to access uh, for learning, as well as obviously world-class research. Excellent, Mike? Yeah, just, just want to add one thing. I completely agree with what both of these guys have said. Uh, for me, um, Shamim's point was excellent, that, that especially during this time, I'm interacting with our board members more often than uh, pre-COVID time, if you will. Um, something that I've also learned through the years is do your best to get involved in dialogue outside of technology. Um, Shamim mentioned it. You don't want to just go in and give the security update, the portfolio update. You want to be part of the broader conversation. But the part that I want to add is, is I've learned that not necessarily through doing it myself, but through mentors that I have. You know them both, Hunter, uh, Ramon Baez and Carl Wilson. Those guys both serve on boards. And, and I would encourage anyone, any CIO, no matter where they're at in their career, if they're looking to get on boards, to find a mentor, that a CIO who's already done that. Um, that has been exceptional for me, uh, for my career in general, but certainly on a trajectory that I want to be on a board someday. Hey, Mike, great, great points. Lev, excellent job. Shameen, great job. Excellent. Next up, folks, we're going to roll into the securing the future of work. Rocco Grillo is the managing director of Alvarez Marsal. He's a rock star in his own right, and he's got an amazing panel. Rocco, welcome. Fantastic. Thanks, Hunter, and thanks for having me again. Been fortunate to be part of the HMG network and um, participate in events like this across the country. Today, we, to Hunter's point, we have a rock star panel put together. Um, but, you know, jumping into the title of our session, Securing the Future of Work, I know a number of people have hit on the security side of it already through today. Uh, for me, I, I've been in the industry 15 plus years, and the things that we've just seen um, from the cyber standpoint, coupled with technology evolving and the sophistication and attacks, helping companies respond to some of the largest attacks over the last decade plus. Um, the last three months, I said in another event I did with Hunter, wow, you, you couldn't have predicted this. And from ransomware attacks, compromises through the cloud, uh, phishing attacks spiking, BEC uh, business email compromises, I'll take the point out, no three-letter three uh, acronyms, uh, nation state attacks, uh, the list goes on. And you know, what a lot of companies have been trying to do, the resilient side of things. But with the panel that we have today, uh, we, we've got some superstars that can help us tackle this, starting with uh, my old friend, uh, Marcus Fowler over at uh, Dark Trace. Also, uh, John Iarnelli, uh, former FBI advisor to the FBI. And uh, last but not least, uh, Boyden Rohner, who we heard earlier from uh, CISA. Uh, but to that end, uh, Marcus, I'm going to throw over to you if you could give us a quick intro, a little bit on your background and a, a point on the theme of today, followed by uh, John and Oh boy, and that'd be great. Sure, anytime. Rocco, always great to, to be here in HMG. Uh, I love these events. Uh, so it's such great networking, such great content uh, and all the sessions uh, up to now, though I will push Hunter on the best panel because, you know, I think we can do better. <laughs> but that's on us. That's on us. That's on us. Uh, so I am Marcus Fowler. I'm the Director of Strategic Threat at Darktrace. Uh, I've only been there actually only about a year. Uh, I spent 24 years in the public sector beforehand. I did 15 years at the CIA. Uh, and then I was in the military before that. Um, my role really is focusing on emerging and next generation threats and how we're positioned for them and kind of continue to improve our ability to provide security. Uh, Darktrace is a company uh, leading AI uh, applied to cybersecurity. And really, if I were to boil it down to a word, it is uh, understanding your sense of self in order to 
defend against whatever comes that isn't normal. So very threat agnostic, uh, which uh, and able to adapt to change, uh, which I think plays very well into all the change that we've seen uh, up to this point. So super excited to be here. Great, thanks for that, Marcus. John, over to you. Thank you very much, Rocco. Hi, everyone. I'm John Yannarelli. I spent over 20 years in the FBI, most of which was working in the cyber division, handling all sorts of cyber crimes and cyber investigations. Since then, I'm now a speaker and a consultant dealing with cyber matters for Fortune 500 companies. Glad to be here today. Thank you, John. Um, Boyden. Yes, good afternoon again. Uh, Boyden Rohner with the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, the uh, the newest uh, federal member of uh, the cyber fo focused workforce, and I'm the associate director for vulnerability management. Fantastic, thank you, Boyden. Um, and to Hunter's point earlier, thank you for your service, all, all, all three of you, for that matter. Um, to, to that end, you know, I, I talked about some of the things earlier that we've been experiencing. I don't want to say not necessarily new but spiked is the word is the common theme in all these areas especially when it comes to the cyber attacks um you know Mar marcus when we were speaking earlier we we talked about not just things from you know a point of the country or as we've seen things especially with this pandemic from a global perspective what are some of the things that you've been tackling and helping companies with from from dark traits perspective as not only we deal with um, the, the challenges of COVID, the overall pandemic, but this whole um, overnight going remote work from anywhere type of environment. Sure. And I think, you know, critical was the fact that everybody was dealing with that business operations and this, ex this sprint to work from home and this, this immediate change. We saw a lot of security teams playing catch up, right? Because it was the business operations that was prioritized, right? That was moved. And how are we going to sustain Right, and how we're going to keep up business operations and the security team. There was no time to catch up, right, or there was no time to keep stay at speed. Uh, and so we saw a lot of them in terms of checking in. How are you feeling now? A lot of changes within the environment. Dependencies on VPNs, uh, dependencies on SaaS applications, dependencies on cloud. The endpoints are to really increase in its security. So how were they feeling about this really change in invisibility? And I think Boyden said this in her opening statement regarding the important importance of invisibility and understanding the environment. And all of a sudden you had very dramatic change in what was visible and what that looked like. So for us, it was ensuring that one, the dark trace was in all the right places they needed it to be. And we were very happy actually that the actually the our unsupervised learning approach allowed it to adapt very well seamlessly to, to the visibility without requiring any external additional tuning or anything like that. And I think that was the first big breath of relief they had was they knew they were still seeing all those things that they needed to see. Uh, and that's a lot of the, but in terms of threats, I think you saw, we saw a lot of the oldies but goodies, uh, but just a, just a, a massive spike in, in a lot of that stuff. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Marcus. And I know one of the things that I enjoy a lot in working with uh, the HMG network is the innovation side of things. And as much as we're in the middle of the fire with a lot of these crises from a cyber standpoint, looking at the different types of things. And when you hear some of the sessions that have gone on, not just today, but some of the other CIOs that have presented here, um, how companies, kudos to them, in the blink of an eye, you know, global organizations, large organizations, that going from hundreds of thousands of people in the blink of an eye to remote workforce. Uh, John, I, I know in you know, the, some of the discussions we've had, as much as we've been able to flip over and companies were able to stabilize, get the infrastructure going on with all these employees, all of a sudden we've got networks all over the place on an individual basis. What are some of the concerns uh, that companies are not only tackling the last three months, but continuing to try to play catch up on? Well, they need to be concerned about what their employees are doing because employees are thinking about getting back to work and getting paid they're not thinking about network security. So I've seen a lot of companies where they have their employees working from home, they're using computers that their kids are using later on after hours. And God only knows what websites they go to, what precautions they've taken or not taken in securing their computers, their Wi-Fi, their network, their router, 
which all of which can affect the corporation as well. So that we need to take some time and make sure employees get in the mindset of security at home the same way they would be in that mindset in the office place. Otherwise, they may be making some money in the short run, but they could be seriously damaging the company over long term. Great, great points. Couldn't agree with you more. And along with that, when we say our employees are remote, that includes the security staff. Um, and in a lot of instances, uh, teams that are already stretched. And Boyd, and I know you've seen a, a lot in this space. And you know, a, a, a avid supporter of your organization, the ISACs, and even some of uh, your colleagues at the bureau, as well as uh, the Secret Service. But the alerts that you put out are phenomenal. But as much as you know, employees are remote, remote, including the security staff. What's some advice that you could give to CISOs from your perspective and the, the lens that you're looking at this from? Yeah, thank you, Rocco. Um, first of all, I just wanted to um, illuminate one interesting trend that we've been seeing as we've been uh, focusing on uh, the healthcare sector and the COVID response organizations, many of whom are in the manufacturing sector. And you know, one of the one of the insights that we bring, having the ability to do our our uh, do our offer our services and then pool all the results is we've actually seen in some cases some improvements in uh, in patching times. Um, so that's been really uh, a surprise. I'm thinking that perhaps some uh, 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 security folks who are working from home may have some less distractions than normal and are able to improve some of their patching times. So that's been a, a particularly in the uh, healthcare sector. So that's been a, a positive trend that kind of surprised us because we were expecting to see something change for sure. Um, but other than that, you know, I think it all comes down to, um, you know, I'm a big believer in the, in if it's either people processes or the technology. And so uh, that's sort of why I love this group so much is that focus on the leadership, uh, focus on the, the people elements. And so, you know, um, being a leader who works with your team and enables your folks to um, multitask their home responsibilities with their work and being flexible in the hours and things they can work at work during the day so they can get the job done you know we uh we are allowing employees to come back to the office on a limited time basis to do the things that they can't do from home and keeping uh very strict uh records of who's going where so that we um can you know do basically our own um, version of contact tracing if we need to um, so just really being flexible and, and like one of your earlier speakers said today, I really believe the employees are motivated and they know what they want to do. And if leadership can listen and help clear any hurdles out of the way, that's the best, that's the best uh, course of action to take. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Boyd. And, um, you know, and, and also that, that thought, um, you know, Marcus, looking at, you know, just the whole transformation of things as much as the, the term, the concept of digital transformation, we've been kicking that around for the last five, 10 years. There's a lot of companies that have jumped onto it. Being thrust into the pandemic, um, companies are going to have to accelerate not only their digital transformation, but I think when we were talking earlier, you, you were saying cultural transformation coupled with digital transformation. Can you expand on that a little bit, Marcus? Sure, and I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, if you, you ever really seen that, whether it's on LinkedIn or whatever, you know, what's responsible for your digital transformation, CEO, CTO, COVID, and there are a lot of checks in the COVID box there for that acceleration. Uh, and, I, and I think culturally, right, and in, in, in thinking through uh, not only what's needed now, but actually building in best practices and lessons learned that's what's working now and would have worked better but now you know it because of COVID, right? And I think in terms of a business culture, it goes to a number of sayings today in terms of listening to your employees and how they're already adapting, right? Some of them are already putting in place some best practices that if you tried to you know, push everything back the way it was, you'd almost break something where they found themselves being more efficient. So some of it is learning from the employees and where they're doing and what they're doing well, right? And that, that listening part of leadership. And another I think is, is envisioning and talking through and providing something of what the other side of this looks like in terms of the culture and the technology being together, right? Because uh, those things really are critical, right? It is, it is both the vision of where you want to take it and the technology and understanding and then the buy-in from your, your entire organization. And that speaks to a broader culture of how you're embracing this. And I think when you saw those companies that didn't hunker down, 
but adapted that almost that accelerated people's desire and that culture to embrace and change with it. And I think you are going to see some, some great changes, but it's only going to be in those companies that embrace that change rather than try and fight it on the other end. No doubt, as well as with the talent pool that we're seeing in the, in the cyberspace with the limited talent, it's, it's almost forced in the hand to, we don't need, you can find a lot of talent in different places that ordinarily aren't in big cities. So another area to look at to your point from a cultural standpoint. John, you know, I, I think on that point as well, and your earlier point about the employees going remote, while we embrace new technologies being remotely as well, um, including third party service providers. I know you and your colleagues and some of the other government agencies put some alerts out, um, you know, as far as attacks on third party service providers. What are some of the dangers that we should be concerned about when our employees or remote workers are, are leveraging these technologies remotely? So I'll preface it by saying it may be very much common sense to everybody on this Zoom call, but we have some training and background experience that others don't have. So it's not necessarily common sense to the average employer. Everybody's setting up, and let's use Zoom for example. We've all heard of Zoom bombing. Everybody today is setting up these calls. It's not just limited to IT setting up the calls for people anymore. I have literally gone to company websites and seen the information posted, Zoom call this time, uh, open meeting, Here's the password, and it's on the public website. So while they're thinking in terms of passwording, they're not thinking in terms of what's the purpose of passwording and how it's supposed to be done. I have counseled, you need to send out Zoom invites separately from the password. If you can send it through a VPN and encrypt your information, so that way you don't have to worry about anybody compromising the passwords. But at the very least, take the time to set up a password. I have popped in on a lot of Zoom calls that I wasn't invited to, but they're wide open. And I've also had a number of clients been Zoom bombed with uh, very graphic swastikas and curse words and things when they're meeting with clients. So when you look at the branding impact and all the negative damage that does as well, we need to remind our employees there's threats out there. It could be foreign sponsored. It can be the competitor next door. If they can hurt our business, they want to do that for a variety of reasons, including driving the business elsewhere. Take the precautions to keep the business safe. It keeps your job safe. Fantastic. Thanks for that, John. And, and Boyd, and I know with, you know, I mentioned all the alerts and the things that you shared at the beginning. Uh, when it comes to the technologies, especially some of the advisories that are out there, without naming any of the companies that have fallen victim to this. Um, there's been an uptick on attacks on the third parties. And I think I saw one article where somebody said, you know, would you rather attack a building that has 500 different offices or the super's office that has the keys to all of those offices? On that front, any insight or pieces that you could share from CISA standpoint, what we should do from a third party standpoint? Yeah, beautiful. Um, you know, this really, uh, you know, mirrors CISA's uh, b belief system on how to manage risk, you know, starting with, uh, you know, high, identifying high value assets and then also identifying high value functions or in our terms, you know, nationally critical functions. So that's kind of a maturity level beyond just knowing the assets. You know, we do a lot of assessments on federal high value assets and, uh, and, and we find it's tricky to, uh, you know, make a, uh, a differentiation between the asset themselves and the environment they're in, that that line is quite blurry. And so it can be a bit of a false, a false, uh, a false sense of security that you've hardened something in particular. Um, you know, CISA is, uh, one, we exist in part to bring the private sector and the public sector together. We like to work with uh, managed service providers, and internet service providers, uh, cloud security providers. Um, we've talked about trying to, um, uh, you know, organize uh, uh, sort of like, uh, you know, bill of rights or or sort of a standards of care things sure. like that. You know, things to get the community all all um, all agreeing to uh, to things like to things like that. You know, really trying to bring that public partner private partnership together. Great points. Thank you for that. And you know, as much as we're all anxious to get back, we've all seen it. 
across the country, across the globe, maybe jumping in too quickly sometimes. At the same time, you know, it's getting back. It feel, feels like it's the next phase as opposed to we're getting past it. And post-COVID is one of those themes that continues to jump up. And Marcus, I know um, you, you had mentioned the point about the hybrid approach or coming back in shifts. Um, could you share some of that for the audience and expand? Sure. I think one of the areas, you know, and, and you know, when I was being asked, like, what advice would you give companies on the other side of this? Uh, and I mentioned how you had to sprint to work from home and the security uh, infrastructure and security teams and all the anxiety had to catch up and there was vulnerability there and visibility and anxiousness. You don't have to sprint back. Right. And I think there's a reason to be phased in your, in your going back and your thoughtfulness in terms of what you put forward and ensuring security is right there with because much like John alluded to and Boyden certainly said, you know, whatever is happening in their in home environment, when they do come back, if that's that bring your own device space or whatever, they may be carrying something that is, you know, not its intent is the corporate network when it gets plugged back in or it gets into that connect connectivity. So I think uh, really thinking about and managing the way that you come back. And I think it isn't, it shouldn't be a hard pivot away for some of the technology that you've leaned on, but rather how do these technologies that we've leaned on now integrate better into this hybrid approach? Cause I think what we're going it, to, it, it's really, and this is one of the biggest changes that we had. And I've talked a lot to our CEO about this uh, in terms of how we thought about security. It's gone away from, digital, just digital environment and digital assets to digital, digital environments, digital assets, but also the dynamic workforce and where they're going to be, right? Because today, Marcus is at home and, you know, and someone else is in the office and maybe that's how it was before, but in the future, I'm home today, I'm there tomorrow, I'm moving, I'm much more dynamic in terms of where I am as an individual and doing my work. And you really need to think about those intelligent, intelligent, adaptable tools that can allow you to have security in any of those instances, whether it's the disruption is because you're working from home or because you're just accelerating digital transformation, all right? And you really needs to be able to be agile and adaptable in terms of what are the requirements for business operations. Fantastic. Thank you, Marcus. John, I know, um, you know, we, we talked earlier about on the post COVID and uh, not that I so much derailed that question because we're, we're still in the middle of this, but you know, with everything that's going on and as we continue moving forward and we do move into the next phase, including going back, what are some of the things that you're keeping an eye on and think, you know, that you want companies to be aware of, they should be on top of. We all know the cyber criminals are very, very smart uh, and the scams are leaning towards COVID, to incorporate COVID and capitalize on it. Just this morning, I received an email that was clearly a scam, and it was from my uh, corporate health director. Well, I am my corporate health director. I'm a company of one, so pretty easy to spot. Right. It was, sub-line uh, was COVID warning for employees. Now, they want you to click on the link and get the information, download the malware. Um, Fortunately, I spoke to me and stopped that from happening, but employees need to recognize that, hey, these risks are coming. They may look like they're from the company that's trying to keep you safe when really it's nothing but a nefarious email trying to hurt you. I work for a national sports league right now as a consultant. They've shifted all of their training they're doing is strictly COVID related to keep you safe online from the latest COVID cyber scam. These uh, criminals are also hacking into legitimate websites embedding malware. We've seen it with John Hopkins and other ma major places, the CDC. So even if you go to a legitimate source, there is a potential. You've got to be aware of what's out there. Make sure you're getting your information from someplace safe. And if you work alone at home, don't trust an email from yourself. That's all I can tell you. But boom, boom. Thank you on that front, John. Classic. Um, Boyd, you know, over to you. I know um, we're coming up on some time, but any blind spots? I mean, again, you probably could give us hours of blind spots that people need to be aware of. But um, in closing, if you, you had one or two that people should keep an eye on as we move forward, that'd be great. Oh, yeah. That, my parting word is, you know, focus on, you've got to prioritize ruthlessly on what it is that you want to secure and so knowing those critical functions knowing that critical asset and and, and making sure that your risk management
program of which vulnerability uh, management is a part of, you know, fits into that. So just, you know, being really clear about what the goal is of your organization so that you know what you need to uh, invest in because everybody's overworked and uh, uh, right now and be, you got to be judicious about where you're spending your time and your energy. Fantastic. Thank you, Boyd. And we've, we've got about just a minute left before Hunter pulls us off. Um, Marcus, take us home with your, any closing thoughts you have. Sure. Well, first, an, another outstanding event. I appreciate so much Boyden's and John's points. I think they're exactly right. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, John's points around, you know, the human and not everyone's a company of one and then being able to, uh, that, that training is important. I do wonder if we're, if we're getting to a point where it's a little unfair to put too much dependency on them in terms of this, your security. Uh, the attackers are getting so good and the employees are so strained uh, that, that technology can, can augment and assist those security teams and those employees. And I think that's an important connection to think about uh, because really the sophistication of these attackers and the way it's scaling isn't going away. Uh, and the humans, God love them. Uh, some of my best friends are humans. The other ones are dogs. Uh, but there's over dependence on them as the, your layer of security rather than uh, certainly a, a good training, good things is, is a little bit of a paper tiger. And I think companies need to be careful. They aren't leaning too heavily on pressuring their employees to be that, that line of failure. Great. Thank you for that, Marcus. And Boyd and John, as well as Marcus, again, thank you for putting together this rock star panel with us today. Hunter, over to you. Excellent job, guys. Thanks so much. Take care. Be safe. Hopefully you can stay for the next, pro, uh, next two segments. So we really got some exciting stuff coming up. Next up is HMG's uh, inaugural Top Technology Innovators Shark Tank uh, program here. And uh, new format. So we have four uh, CEO, founder type CTOs of four really unique companies, very interesting companies. Uh, very excited and proud to say uh, each founder, CEO, CTO will get two minutes kind of framing out their vision of the market, the problem or the issue they are addressing, uh, what's unique about their organization and their go-to-market, a little sales USP kind of a comment. And then we'll come back, bring everyone back together after each founder gets two minutes, we'll bring everyone back together for a 10 minute panel. So first up is Glenn Chisholm. Glenn's the co-founder and CEO of Obsidian Software. Hey Glenn, welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me, Hunter. Great to see you. A Greylock company based uh, in LA, uh, I'm sure with a global footprint, global presence. Uh, you got your two minutes. Go for it. Obsidian Security is focused on helping companies secure their SaaS and their cloud environments. You know, we, we, we believe that as companies have moved towards SaaS, as they've expanded into this, this space, particularly in the COVID times, but even before that, you know, what you had is you had a movement to these SaaS platforms because of the obvious benefits. And, and what we want to do is we want to enable that to be secure. So how do we do that? We help you understand the configuration of your SaaS environments. Who's using them? What are they actually doing in those environments? Who's sharing what with whom, when? How do they interact with each other? Who's trying to access your environments? And giving you a single unified picture so you can understand who's exporting data from Workday, who's doing what in 365, who's downloading what in Box, Who's, who's joining your Zoom meetings? Who might be Zoom bombing your Zoom meetings? What's actually happening? Who's recording your Zoom meetings? All of these things come together to give you a single picture for your environment. And you know, Obsidian provides that. And you know, our, our mission is to be able to use the power of SaaS to defend SaaS. So it's quick to deploy, it's high value, it's uh, very fast to, to, to get value from it. It's low impact to your security teams and it allows you to, 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 to drive to the cloud, to utilize the cloud and to absolutely get the benefits of the cloud, but do it in a way that's secure. And, and you know, take the burden off your employees and focus the burden on the tooling where it should be to, 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 to speed things up. So, you know, we're working with companies in, in uh, the financial services, we're working with technology companies, manufacturing, healthcare, uh, educational, to allow them to secure SaaS, allow them to secure, you know, tools like 365, Salesforce, Workday, Box, Dropbox, um, you know, uh, uh, Git, GitHub type environments where your source code is, all of these things together into a very coherent and clean and approach to allow you to be more secure in the cloud. Excellent job, Glenn. Great job. Thank you. 
Next up, Nick Durkin is the uh, field CTO at Harness. Harness is a Menlo Ventures uh, company, correct, Nick? That's correct. Absolutely. I think, you know, Harness being a continuous delivery as a service platform, you know, our challenge here is dealing, dealing with software delivery. And today it's been a challenge for most. It's been extremely complex. It's been massively scripted and securing it to that point has been a nightmare. So our mission is to truly easily automate, right? All of the software delivery, right? Make sure that it's verified. So don't stop at just delivering the artifacts to a server, but make sure that they're actually good the same way your best engineers would, but do it with a massive amount of machine learning and a tiny bit of AI. Right after you verify it, you have to make sure it's all secure, making sure that you have all of your audit, your compliance and your regulatory pieces covered. Uh, so that you truly have a holistic uh, idea of software delivery and doing this as a service, truly taking away from the scripting. This came from, I mean, I'll be honest, I was a sysadmin uh, for the banks. I was working on critical infrastructure. So I dealt with all the delivery teams. I dealt with all the change controls, all the pieces that would be there. And then even the large war rooms after, God forbid something broke. And it was really to be able to remove that, but give you the same amount of control in an automated fashion. When you talk about customers, what a happy customers look like, Nutanix, thank you guys for sponsoring this. Uh, they've achieved a 93% reduction in deployment time just by using Harness alone, right? Uh, this is about removing engineering toil to stop them from wasting the time on the deployments, but really the actual things they want to build. It's about increasing deployment velocity, allowing them to deploy faster and more often. And even some you know, folks like Logmian, right? Uh, some of their engineering teams just picked up Harness and got to production within a week by themselves. Right. If you want to try this out, you can go to harness.io. You can actually download it. But more importantly, if you ask, we'll give you a free proof of value. We'll come on site and we'll actually guess it, get this up and going. Or uh, now in COVID times, we'll do it remotely for you. But we'll, we'll make sure that you get all that you can at, at harness.io. Excellent, Nick. Great job. Thanks for coming on the program. We'll see you in a, at the panel here in a minute. Next up is Raul Kashup. Uh, Raul's the president and CEO of Awake Security. Raul, welcome to the program. Hi, great to be here, Hunter. Uh, Awake Security is designed to uh, cater to the, uh, the problems of what I call as the new network. So what has happened in the last decade is the network has transformed dramatically. So when I say network in, a, in any large or medium enterprise today, I mean, you know, I'm talking about a little bit of data center traffic, a little bit, you know, a little bit of user traffic, uh, traffic from your Google, Amazon, Azure, and also your SaaS applications. So what we do uh, at Awake is we want to give you a single pane of glass for your entire network combined together uh, in a single place where you can uh, understand, investigate, and decide for yourself what's really going on across uh, you know, your, your, your disparate networks. Uh, so we extract metadata from your network traffic and we build uh, machine learning models on top of that. Uh, it's called as network detection and response. Uh, and the and the entire focus is to basically to be able to respond uh, to threats which are you know, coming from various sources. Like in today's world, it's coming from remote uh, you know, homes. People are logged in their homes and coming from VPNs. So we cater to the needs of uh, the broad uh, and encompassing network of your enterprises. And then what we do is that we use these uh, metadata we extract, and then we build out automation to really understand how to automate the threat analysis and threat hunting. So we can save you a lot of time instead of doing it manually. We can automate all of these complex tasks uh, and, and literally like, uh, just like you have a self-driving car, give you a, a very similar experience with your network security. And our uh, the clients are large uh, financial services, uh, several Fortune 100, uh, 200 companies uh, are our clients and we are rapidly growing right now. Excellent role. Thanks so much. We'll be back in a sec. Next up is Krishna Yarlagata. Did I get it close enough, Krishna? Yeah, you're dead. You're dead. <laughs> Thank you so much. Founder and CEO of Huddle AI. What is Huddle AI doing? Yeah, it's easy to explain Huddle AI now in the, you know, obviously post COVID world, you know, uh, we're all in meetings just like this. And I think there's a lot, a ton of them happening. And uh, somebody told me the other day that, uh, you know, that there's, uh, you know, there's about 50 to 70 million meetings per day happen in corporate America. And, and uh, you know, there's about over at $1.5 trillion of our people's time is invested and a large portion gets wasted uh, because, you know, we don't have photographic memory. We all mean well, but we don't quite remember what we promise and what we see, what we say, where we made note of. And I mean, we all can relate to this. And, and I think what Huddle AI is obviously, you know, offering a meeting room, just like, uh, 
you know, Zoom and others do, and they've done a great job in offering a meeting room. We all got to uh, learn to, you know, I think it was pre-COVID, you know, there was a lot of hesitation how to do audio video, or at least in some people they said, you know, it'll take a generation to change, but I think that all, you know, changed overnight that uh, all of us have become experts but then that's, 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 that's good. But you know, once you get, the, get into the room, then what? So it's all about outcomes. We all uh, meet uh, for a purpose. There is a goal. And what Huddle AI is doing is try and capture uh, the key aspects of the meeting uh, using AI machine learning. And, and that drives the outcomes and in the form of agenda action items and notes, and we call them moments. The idea is to create, can we get a five minute summary of uh, your meeting out of the 60 minute meeting with your help, obviously through machine learning, we call it a moat, uh, it's called a meeting note. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, that's, that's essentially what uh, Hale AI does. We're about 50 people and I've been working for the past two and a half years. Uh, we have uh, folks like Nutanix that are using our product and uh, you know, we've been able to use by 80 different countries and, and uh, it's, it's a number of people who've you know, used it and they're quite happy and you guys want to, Use, you know, just send me a note or uh, Krishna at huddle.ai and uh, we'll enable you and we'd love to talk to you more about huddle.ai. Excellent, Krish. Stay with us. Thanks for uh, coming on the program. So back up to Glenn. Hey, Glenn, uh, when you think about uh, SaaS and cloud, uh, it's been around for a while, right? It's ever since Benioff probably coined the phrase 20 years ago, uh, Mark Benioff, that is. Um, why is securing the cloud such a critical uh, um, aspect or important idea in the enterprise? I think, you know, we started out with, you know, Mark bringing out Salesforce and bringing tooling to the cloud that, that, that was, that changed the way IT interacted with, um, with products. So when you start to think about Salesforce as the great example, Salesforce is often not bought by necessarily IT. You know, sometimes collaboration tools are not necessarily bought by IT. Tools are not necessarily bought by IT anymore. They're bought into the company by functional areas of the business. The, the security team still has the absolute responsibility to maintain security for the organization. So those tools bring to the table fantastic capability, agility, and security's job is to enable that agility, to enable that capability, but to do it in a way that's safe for the enterprise. So as these new tools come in, the organizations that provide them provide the underlying platform security, but you're responsible for securing your data and your people and what they do in the tooling. And that's where Obsidian comes in. It allows you to create a unified picture of all of your SaaS and you know, cloud environments in a single place, in a single console, rapidly deployable, and it allows you to provide the security to keep the agility, to keep the performance up for your, for your, for your IT teams. Excellent. So uh, walk me through a, a few examples of Obsidian in action. You know, Obsidian's, Obsidian's there to, to, um, to be able to identify, you know, the disgruntled employee that's going to leave attempting to extract information, the, you know, compromised accounts where, 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 where external attackers have managed to compromise credentials and are attempting to extract information through, through these cloud platforms. Obsidian's there to, to work out when employees are inappropriately collaborating, perhaps by accident, perhaps deliberately. So this is, this is, this is the, the spectrum of insider external threats um, allow you to run incident response. You know, we call this as a package cloud detection and response. And so as you, as you use these detection and response capabilities on the endpoint and the network, you have to have that same level of sophistication in the cloud. And that's what Obsidian brings. Excellent. And Glenn, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, ObsidianSecurity.com. We'll give you a trial straight away. We can get you up and running in minutes and fully operational within hours. Excellent. Great job. Uh, I'll, I'll circle back to you if we have time. Hey, Nick, when you think about uh, deploying so software forever, we, we, um, we've had to continue down a similar path. Uh, in this security conscious world that we're in right now, you know, in the post-COVID uh, world, how does Harness help manage and mitigate risks for organizations? Sure. No, I think, you know, one of the things that's important is that <clears throat> we've applied a lot of security requirements through manual uh, verifications, through people, through checkbox, and through audit. And the reality is in order to achieve the deployment velocities that we need to to compete, no longer can we have people checking off on a, on a control board, you know, uh, 20 times a day now when we're trying to deploy when that was a once weekly thing. And so in order to do that, we have to be able to apply all of the requirements, all the governance uh, standards into pipelines, make sure that they are true templates that people can use. 
and make sure that everything's audited in order to report back to our, uh, our regulatory commissions or even just even back to our security functions. And the idea is that no longer should this be a massive process, you know, across 19 different teams and 20 different tools and have to be gathered. It should be all easily accessible for, you know, even the developer who wrote the code to be able to very clearly understand how it got from code commit all the way through to production, right? And to be able to see how that, how that gets there and to be able to truly define those. Uh, the idea is to make that easy and consumable for everyone in the company. Not everyone has to be that security expert. Not everyone has to be the expert at deploying to multiple clouds, right? As we move to a DevOps type world, um, not all of our engineers understand our architectures that we've had and all the different environments that we are. So really being able to abstract that from them while giving them all the security audit and compliance uh, applied by those individuals. What, uh, how do you, what do you layer in when you implement? How does it, how does it, how does it uh, happen? Sure. So I think, you know, one of the things that, that folks do is they've got an idea and a concept of a, you know, a template that they'd like to apply across all the different deployment types. And as they're moving to microservices, the idea is now we can come up with very standard specific templates that allow you to progress to different environments only if and only if you've actually met those requirements. So only go through dev, you know, even start deploying to dev if you've met your, your security scans and, and, your, and your static code analysis. Once you're in dev, uh, you know, if that succeeds, maybe you get to progress to QA, but in QA, you have to follow other standards. Um, as we move through to UAT and, and so forth, locking that down so that only the very specific security governance or, or operating teams can actually affect how those get there, but really give them an, a way and a template to be able to do so easily. But the idea here, very simply, uh, you want to be able to look at all the metrics that a company is, is really relying on in their deployment and not to stop at deployment. So let's say we do actually deploy it to production. Um, that's not where continuous delivery stops. We have to verify that they're good, all right? So you're gonna look at the same way your best engineers would, you're gonna look at your metrics, you're gonna look at your logging, uh, you're gonna look at your custom business metrics to understand what normal looks like. And heck, we probably even have a knock that's looking at that today. The idea is to take all of that and automate that same mentality and use a massive amount of machine learning, tiny little bit of AI to understand what that normal looks like, to be able to allow you to get then into production and stay in production. And then God forbid, because we know how you deployed, where you deployed, with which secrets and which configuration also have the ability to get you back to where you were without you having to write code. And again, that's all part of, of the Harness uh, platform to be able to give you all of that in, in really a matter of minutes. So we can get you up and deploying at harness.io uh, in minutes and ultimately we can get you to production within a week. Excellent, Nick, how, did, how can people get in touch with you? Sure, I think easiest way, go to harness.io. You can talk to us there. You can um, uh, apply for a trial. You can download uh, right now and get, get operating at uh, harness.io. Great, thank you. Uh, Raul, uh, welcome back. Uh, when you think of uh, defining risk and measuring risk in the new world where security models are no longer what they used to be, how do you assess uh, a risk profile in the enterprise and where does a wake fit into uh, that stack? Yeah, I think uh, risk is uh, a bit of a loaded term in security now. Uh, and unfortunately, it has become synonymous with the notion of alert being high, medium, or low. And uh, I would say this is a very uh, you know, old school approach. Uh, and, and it kind of is almost like ambulance chasing in, in many cases because uh, uh, the context is very important. Uh, if you have a high risk device, uh, if, is it in your cafeteria or is it your CFO's laptop? Understanding and really identifying of what's really going on and adding that context is very important. And uh, so our recommendation is uh, take an asset centric continuous observation perspective to risk, which means that uh, when you monitor a device uh, you know, or, or, user an, or, or a user or an application, uh, you should be able to track its behaviors over a period of time uh, and even the weak and strong signals coming, you know, uh, you know, what are they emitting, what's really going on there. And then uh, having the historical perspective really gives you the evidence chain to really decide and, and gather uh, for yourself if this is a high risk or not. So I think uh, this is a kind of more actionable. This is, you know, you have, uh, you know, as opposed to just giving alerts, uh, this is a far more meaningful approach uh, to really uh, going after high risk devices, particularly. And a very good example of, of this is ransomware. For example, you know, uh, we have identified that before a ransomware hits you, there are several weak signals uh, which it will emit before the whole disaster strikes you. So if you can identify and, and bubble up those high profile devices, uh, how can you get smart about those? 
So yeah, I think our approach is kind of uh, being more uh, contextual and more uh, meaningful uh, when it comes to uh, qualifying and identifying high risk devices. Excellent. Hey, Rule, uh, thanks for coming on the program today. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, the easiest way is, you know, uh, reaches out as uh, awakesecurity.com or my email, rahul at awakesecurity.com. <clears throat> Excellent. Great to see you again, Rahul. Talk soon. So, Krish, uh, wrapping up the program here, when you think about um, Huddle and why Huddle is the time is right for Huddle right now, we heard the metrics regarding meetings. We've all been in dysfunctional meetings. What's your kind of closing idea there? Yeah, you know, I think, right, I think I kind of call it, you know, WebEx was the 1.0, and I think the, or the second inning is played by Zoom, and I think there's more winnings to be played in the next 10 years. I think AI ML is going to play a big role. I think, you know, we all, you know, are moving away from the meeting room architecture that people talked about, you know, we have a meeting room and we all go and then knock yourself out and, you know, enter the bunch, you know, code and other click a link. But I think we've seen all those issues. But of course, the AV part is very important, but that's getting commoditized over time, as we can see. But the key aspect is the purpose of the meeting itself. And I think that's what is, is all about as you move forward. And I think that's what uh, Huddle is focused on. You know, it's intrusion risk or late start, late finish or off topic or distracted attendees and no minutes. So we're addressing all of those areas. And, uh, you know, we're excited about the opportunity in the next uh, five, 10 years in, in the whole meeting space and in general collaboration space. Excellent. Great job, Krishna. How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, and, and just go to uh, huddle.ai huddle and you can sign up or uh, you can reach me, Krishna, at uh, huddl.ai. Excellent. You. Hey, I just want to thank everyone, uh, Glenn, uh, Raul, Nick, and, and Krish. Great job. Uh, this was our first. I think uh, hopefully you liked it. Uh, we want to repeat it at other summits across North America, across the world. I think there's a great service you bring, folks, as you're all founders, CEOs, and very creative CTOs and helping redefine uh, the future state of enterprise architecture and apps and security. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Next, next up, we have Brian Brockway. Brian's the VP and CTO of Conval, uh, a former uh, practitioner. Uh, he's not the average partner, but uh, I would say <laughs> he's a, a real practitioner, thought leader. Brock's a great guy. You know, Brock, when you think about today's panels hit on it, some exciting different ways to reimagine the future of business with increasing data flow, access and trust to adapt and embrace new digital collaboration and team and customer interactions in totally new ways, as well to start to increase our digital dependency. Uh, every new advantage also opens a potential new risk to contend, to, to contend with um, as digital flow gets attacked or hijacked, right? Um, Absolutely. So we want bring, to bring you on the program here to really de demystify uh, what's going on and, and get some truth here. What, uh, what really matters uh, today with, regarding our data, uh, our security, and uh, our data centers? And uh, why don't you take it away from there? Uh, terrific. Thanks, Hunter. Um, yeah, so I think, and, and just kind of listening to the last conversation, there was a lot of great points uh, developed around the new risks uh, classification, all kind of the, the new dimensions you need to start to weave into your strategy. Uh, at Conval, one of the things we're, we're very focused on has always been the notion around data protection and recovery. Uh, and I think as we start to kind of look forward to that whole uh, digital dependency, all the great agile benefits you, you were talking about, um, the inherent risk on the backside of that is what happens if you come back in tomorrow and uh, your data got damaged or taken away altogether. Uh, so that's where it's a lot of rethinking these days, not kind of the afterthought, how do I put recovery and other things back in, but really how do you start to build it in from day zero? And in a lot of those cases, you know, there's the, the nominal problems of kind of call it working too fast and making mistakes. So kind of uh, uh, the great nature of agile is things get created really rapidly and very quickly. Uh, did somebody forget to add a protection policy to make sure you have a copy of it? you can get back to if you need to. Uh, to the other side of the spectrum, which is uh, just as, as you point, uh, point from may, being made before on ransomware, uh, there's a lot of uh, bad actors. There's a lot of people out there <laughs> trying to do uh, pretty destructive damage uh, to businesses at the data layers. And uh, when those happen, uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a small issue. 
uh, it becomes a much larger issue and an escalating issue of how do you go back and recover yourself back into a business operating state. Hey, Brock, a little context and background, just so folks can get, can get to know you as a sure. thought leader. Uh, can you give us a minute on that, please? Um, love to. Uh, so, uh, so I've been in the data, <clears throat> data management, data protection space with Commvault now for just about 16, uh, let me restate that, 17 years now. Um, prior to that, spent a number of years uh, in the analyst community on uh, Wall Street, on a variety of different companies, and and uh, even Gartner Consulting uh, many years back. So uh, there's been, as you pointed out, there's a lot of uh, pragmatic, practical nature uh, that I kind of developed through the years. And it's one of the things we like to really kind of talk about when we think about that intersection of technology, architecture, you know, how do we find kind of the root problems and then look for some of the innovative ways to uh, eliminate it or make it uh, a lot faster, better, and easier. Can this be a real costly venture if it goes awry? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you look at some of the studies out there these days and uh, cyber events and others, you know, well beyond just kind of the Bitcoins on a couple of laptops. Um, Accenture just did one a little while ago, published, I think the starting price on an event was almost $11 million in cost. Um, take that a couple steps further and, you know, we've dealt with a lot of customers that have had one of those events and it's not just, you know, a uh, selection of the IT environment. It basically takes out the entire infrastructure. Uh, so this has knocked out supply chains, factories and things like that. And we've seen those kind of events go from that $10 million number up to about $100 million. You're out of operations for almost a month as you're trying to go back and rebuild and restart and then turn the factories and turn kind of the flow back on. This is where it really has been uh, a new kind of a, a, a new reversing philosophy of how do I design for recovery, not just how do I try to consolidate and, and copy data and pack it away, but how do I really design that if I have to go back and rebuild the business tomorrow, uh, is it practical and how can I do it? Well, what does a, a readiness concept state look like? Uh, what's the model look like ideally from your point of view? Yeah, it's, it's uh, and, and this kind of came through, um, I'm going to say the last couple of years, um, uh, it started two or three years ago when we uh, helped a number of customers through probably the one of the world's largest uh, public, publicly announced um, uh, ransomware events in Nampetia. Uh That was stopping ships at sea, you know, doing some uh, catastrophic damage. And uh, that infected the system and basically destroyed the system in a matter of minutes. So from those events, while we came back in, boots on the ground to help people start to go back and rebuild systems. And some of those customers took, you know, 10 or 15 days to get 10,000 systems or 50,000 systems back in place. Others took longer just because nobody had ever planned contingencies when all core systems were gone. That's where uh, a lot of us kind of sat down and kind of the, the post analysis and said, there's kind of a, a new philosophy you have to design around. And that's one that we like to talk about on recovery readiness. So we kind of look at it from four dimensions. There's a first dimension of you just going into your data environment today uh, and doing kind of some of your foundational hardening. Uh, do I have uh, current copies of data? Do I have it in different locations? Uh, do I have it with some geographic separation? Uh, do I have security policies wrapped around it? So. Uh, a business owner doesn't also have uh, full control and access to all the backup copies because uh, while I trust my business partner uh, inherently, uh, if their credentials got compromised, somebody can delete something on the front and delete everything on the back and then I'm really in a, in a suck case. So a lot of that foundation is ensuring you've got good separation of data, locations, security policies, access and other controls from once you have your foundation set, then it's really a matter of starting to, to add automation to the problem. How do I turn on more validation? How do I guarantee uh, I can go back and put back not eight systems, but can I put back 80 systems? Uh, what happens if I had to put back 800 systems? Uh, do I have a plan? Do I have the orchestration automation to go off and do those kind of events? Um, this is where I think that the additional capabilities come in to say, how do you start to classify things? Um, unfortunately, we can't treat 8,000 systems all the same way. <laughs> it's a little too expensive. Um, you have to start thinking about your different policies and classifications. I think there are some uh, 
uh, great conversations in the last discussion on that of using that to define your SLAs, kind of teach the system what sequence and what order do you want to go through. And then when it does happen and you need to go back and put into full response, you know, how do you kick the automation into gear and let it start to do things in the right sequence? Excellent. Interesting. And then what about automation? Where does automation kick in? Yeah, I think it one, so once you put all the pieces together, I've got, I've got hardening, I've got things kind of organized. I've had it classified in my most criticals and my least critical. Uh, that's where you're able to come over and really kind of wrap the, the full benefits of automation around the model. Um, these days, what we're seeing in a lot of cases too is a, a huge intersection with the cloud environments. Uh, how do I go in and embrace that elastic nature of the cloud that uh, it's one of the few locations that if I needed 500 servers tomorrow, I don't have to wait 12 weeks for an order to come in from a supplier. Um, I can show up tomorrow and I can create, you know, uh, workloads and servers and other things on demand. What I need to make sure I have though is do I have the automation? Do I have the conversions? Do I have all the security policies and privileges and everything else all ready to go? So when I create that new environment and I'm running my business now in the cloud for the next two weeks or the two months uh, as I'm going back and uh, resetting from the event, um, you know, do I do that without adding more risk to the equation? That's tie that all together. That's where automation really becomes the critical, uh, the critical, critical success factor to make it all real. And Brock, this all sounds like really sound advice. Um, how does someone go back and measure their environment uh, against the readiness curve? And it, and that's good. We uh, so uh, and this is this is kind of the taking the conceptual ideas and saying, how do I make them a little bit more pragmatic? Um, what we've done is we've sat down with a, a number of customers and best practices and others and tried to encapsulate some of that into uh, a discussion guide. Um, so it's really taking some of these ideas. How do you go back in and ask your teams, you know, do we have uh, the right levels of security separation? Uh, how do we do role bases inside the environment? Uh, if we did get compromised, um, either by uh, a frustrated employee or somebody who uh, lost their credentials. How do I limit the scope of that, uh, of that exercise? Uh, what we've done is we put that into a nice paper, um, I think on one of the uh, Q&A or, or the uh, panel sections, uh, they're gonna add in a nice link. It's a great thing to take down uh, and just start to put some of this into, uh, take some of the concept and put it into a more practical discussion you can have with your teams and just figure out, you know, how well how well are you uh, set for this kind of environment, or are there room for improvements, you know, and how can you start thinking about how do we close those gaps? Great. And uh, do you guys do these work sessions with uh, clients and prospects? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, it's this is something that uh, so Commvault being uh, you know a, a recognized leader in the data protection data management space for many years a lot of that success and innovation came out of customer interaction. So uh, I'll say, while we end up implementing technology at the end of it, uh, a lot of it is sitting down to say, uh, how do we assess what the environment looks like today? Where's room for improvement? How can you modernize and really employ some of these great automation and other methodologies quickly? Yeah, you know, without having to go back and you know do a complete overhaul in some cases or take better advantages of things like the cloud environments uh, incorporate that back into your data center strategy in a fast and easy basis without adding a lot of additional hardware or technology or other uh, other devices in the middle. So when you think about a client engagement, um, what does it look like uh, from start, uh, middle, and end? Yeah, so what we uh, normally, in a lot of cases, we'll, we'll come in and we usually find somebody uh, either trying to address some of the new strategies, uh, they're starting to move off of uh, virtualization into containers and other spaces. And uh, the DevOps teams are, are starting to run really fast, but the IT team has to go back in and figure out how do they catch up and add compliance. Uh, that will usually be the first use case to come over and say, how do I start to utilize some of this capability to come over, you know, ensure that they can run fast, but I can also stay, you know, uh, safe and uh, compliant behind them. Uh, once you start the process on one workload, and that's really kind of where you get back to uh, power of tools. Can it start to consolidate across other workloads, other tool sets? Can I start to modernize some of the other parts and tools that I'm running in the environment to help consolidate and you know, uh, develop a better set of economics on the go forward future? 
when you think of also industries that uh, Commvault has success in, I know finance is one space. What are the other mm -hmm. verticals that you guys uh, do great work in? Yeah, so uh, I think we're, we're pretty much, uh, I'm going to say, uh, we show up in a lot of horizontal places. Uh, so as you said, not only is, you know, the finance sector and government sectors um, uh, uh, from state and local to federal space and, and DOD and commercials. Um, more and more cases, though, we're also starting to see um, lots of big pickup, um, especially when you start to think about the aspects of ransomware. Uh, ransomware is unforgiving, and it doesn't just, you know, it doesn't just target one or two verticals. So we're seeing it everywhere from small state and local, you know, township governments that are being held hostage these days to come over and say, how do I implement a protection and recovery strategy, you know, all the way up to uh, global internationals uh, doing it on, on a regular basis and trying to do the intersection of uh, data centers and clouds and even SaaS tied into a, a common bundle. Okay. You know, one last question. Uh, when you think about this whole uh, crisis, uh, any takeaways, lessons learned, Brock? Uh, I think the lesson learned in a lot of cases is uh, stop and assess uh, what you have today. And I think that the hardest lesson we all learned from those events a couple of years ago uh, is nobody ever planned for recovery on a mass scale. So we all thought about for years, how do we, how do we pack and put things away and try to reduce costs, but nobody ever did the reverse logic. If, if I had to take it all back out again as quickly as possible, how do I get that done? Uh, and that's, I think a lot of the new reversing logic is come back over and plan for one of these events. Uh, if you can plan for it, you build the right architecture. When it happens, you can respond to it in a much faster and a cleaner environment. I think hey Brock, thanks for coming on the program today. How can people get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll drop my email into the Q&A, uh, but it's uh, bbrockway at convault.com. And uh, I encourage everybody, if you, if you uh, want to read on a little bit further, take a, take a look at the uh, white paper we're going to attach in there. It helps put some of this discussion back into context you can share with your teams. Great, Brock. Great to be with you. Great to see you. Hey, that Thanks, wraps Robert. up another amazing summit. Hope you enjoyed it. Big shout out to, again, Commvault, Nutanix, Zoom, and Darktrace. Really appreciate your support and engagement. Uh, all our thought leaders, our speakers, our uh, uh, panelists, great job, folks, uh, as well as a big shout out to uh, DFW uh, Sim. Great partnership for 14 years of running. Uh, hopefully you can refer other folks to our other summits, folks. Um, we're out there about every week uh, in different markets. Um, again, thanks again for being engaged and uh, please uh, reach out to our partners or our partners reach out to them, reach back to them. Uh, stay safe and we'll see you soon. Thanks.